Hello, folks. How are you doing today? Uh, I am going to go over respiratory riddles, which is the introduction for chapter 13. And you'll have to excuse me. I don't have my really nice stylus that's in the classroom. I'm going to have to order another one. So I kind of have this gigantic stylus that looks like a little kid's fat crayon. So I'll do the best that I can. So in the first question, it says, how many lobes do your lungs have? So your lungs are kind of separated into some different compartments. Um, and if you said five, you would be correct. And that kind, of, that kind of sounds weird because you have two lungs, so you might think, hey, you should have an even number. Um, but within the lungs, so this is the trachea coming down. Those are the bronchi. Here would be the left lung, here would be the right lung, because remember we're always looking at the patient in correct anatomical position and it's kind of opposite than what we think. Um, the right lung is separated into three sections, but the left lung is only separated in two. Why? Because it has kind of an indentation out of it, which we call the cardiac notch, which if you guessed right, that's where the heart is going to sit on the left side. So the lungs, the right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. Moving on to question two, what is the difference, so the difference between the respiratory zone and the conducting zone, okay? So kind of use a band analogy. So the conductor, all right, themselves, so a conductor in a band is what I'm saying, is somebody who they just kind of make music happen, but they're not actually playing it. Um, and I want you to think about this analogy here. So in the conducting zone, air is just being funneled into the body. So there's no active respiration or absorption of air happening in the conducting zone. So this would be our nose, our mouth, our tr our trachea, um, our bronchi, our bronchioles. These are all conducting zones where we are trying to just get air into our body to the respiratory zone. The respiratory zone is actually the location where gas exchange occurs. And to simplify that, the respiratory zone only includes a structure or structures called the alveoli. Those are the little great light clusters we've talked about in the lungs. That is where gas exchange is, is actually occurring. So where oxygen is coming into the body and carbon dioxide is going out of the body and that occurs in the respiratory zone. Everything else is a conducting zone. So it's essentially just a channel to get stuff in and out. So number three here, talking about what is the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx? So this question has to do with real estate. Does anybody know what the most important thing is about real estate? Location, location, location. And we can apply this here. So the pharynx, all right, is a structure that connects your mouth and your nose to your trachea, okay? Well, to your larynx first um, and then end up to your trachea, okay? And the difference between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and the laryngeopharynx is location. The nasopharynx is the posterior aspect of your nasal cavity. Your oropharynx is the posterior aspect of your oral cavity. And your laryngeopharynx is what's the kind of border between your pharynx and your larynx, okay? So it's all one continuous structure, but... I'm going to do a, that's a pretty good drawing for me. Oh, interesting chin. So here would be your nasal cavity coming down. There's your oral cavity. Let's see. Do, do, do. You guys know how I like to hum when I, when I sing. So let me change colors here. So this would be your nasal pharynx. This would be your oral pharynx. And then this would be 
your laryngeal pharynx, but it's all one continuous tube going down. Next question, um, how do the vocal folds function? So vocal folds is another term for your vocal cords. So if you look down somebody's throat and you look to the trachea, that's the opening, so that would be the lumen, right, getting down to the trachea. Um, there are these loose connective tissue folds right here, okay? And those are the vocal folds. And what happens is that as we move our throat, or our throat, as Will would say, um, and as air rushes by these, they're going to vibrate and stretch and thin and move, and that's what helps us create sound or speech. All right, what is the purpose of the epiglottis? Okay, so let's look at this word. Epi means on top of, and what does glottis mean? So previously I drew the opening of the trachea, and then I had drawn your vocal folds like this. Well, the opening of the trachea is called the glottis. So if you have the epiglottis, what does it do? It actually sits, let me do it in a different color. Um, this is the Hulk's epiglottis apparently. So it would be this little thing of connective tissue here that when we swallow, okay, it comes down and ends up covering over the glottis. Why? Because in our throat, we have two tubes. We have one here and we have one here, okay? So then this would be the I'll draw another awesome person. So here's the neck. Pretty good. Okay. Kind of looks like Megamind. So in, in somebody, they have two tubes. All right. And this front tube would be your trachea. And this back tube, so this would be your, oops, I want to do it in green. Trachea. And the back is the, anybody want to take a guess? Whoever said it is correct is the esophagus. So, I don't know if I'm going to write, but that, okay? So, right here is the opening to the trachea, which we call the glottis, all right? So, the epiglottis actually is this little bunch of tissue that when somebody swallows, the epiglottis comes over and covers the glottis. So that food will not go down the trachea to the lungs, but goes down the esophagus to the stomach. Now, in order to, in order to make speech, the glottis cannot be covered by the esophagus because air has to rush by it in order for us to produce sound. So if you are eating and talking at the same time, what's going to happen is that this glottis is now open. It's exposed because the epiglottis is up. It's not closed. So if you're talking and eating at the same time, you're really opening yourself up for choking. So don't do that. The next question is talking about what is the difference between internal and external respiration? Well, breathing or respiration, if you will, is actually a four-step process that we're going to learn about. Um, and external and internal respiration are parts of that, okay? So, I mean, the first thing we actually have to do is we have to get air physically into the body. We have to get it down its conducting zone, so it's got to go through the nose or the mouth, preferably the nose, um, your pharynx, your larynx, your trachea, your primary bronchi, your secondary bronchi, bronchioles, and then it's going to get to the alveoli. And so I'm going to draw that right now. So here would be a bronchus, and then you have 
the alveoli here, which are these little grape-like clusters, okay? So air is coming in and it's going to the alveoli. We know in our pulmonary circuit, right, so blood vessels coming from the heart uh, to the lungs to pick up oxygenated blood here. So this would be deoxygenated blood. Let's see, I'm going to do it in a different color because I think the purple is confusing. This would be deoxygenated blood coming in in this dark blue, okay? And then what's going to happen is that CO2 is going to come out and be absorbed into the alveoli. And then what's going to happen is that oxygen, which is in a higher concentration in the alveoli, is going to come here. Now, this air that is in your lungs is essentially from the environment. It's external. It's from the outside. So we call this process external respiration. So even though it occurs in your alveoli, the air, all right, that's coming in, you're basically exchanging between your body and the environment here. We're bringing oxygen from the environment in and CO2 that we've created in our bodies, we're pushing that out into the environment. So that is external respiration. Internal respiration is between not us and the environment, but us and us. So this blood right here is going to go do, 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 do all the way through the body, okay? And we're going to get into our capillary beds in our cardiovascular system. And then our cells, so this is a cell, and a cell, okay, um, one's going to say, hey, I need to get rid of my CO2. And this one says, hey, I need to get rid of my CO2. And it's going to go into blood. So it's going to get picked up by the capillary bed and sent off in the venous system. But then the oxygen that was hanging out in the blood is going to come into these cells. We call this, because it's between our blood cells and our body cells, internal respiration. All right, next question talks about what does surfactant do? So I believe we've talked about surfactant before in the classroom, but surfactant is a chemical that is produced by type 2 alveolar cells. So let's think about that. So alveolar means in the alveoli, so in those little grape-like clusters where I just told you external respiration takes place. Um, we want those alveoli to look like nice big grapes, okay? We want them to be very open, or the word is patent, P-A-T-E-N-T, -E okay? If we remember from chapter two, talking about inorganic substances like water, we know that our body is mostly made up of water. And what does water, what do water molecules like to do? Well, they like to hang on to each other. They like to hold hands. They like to make things kind of collapse in over each other. Um, if we had that happen in our alveoli, we would not get a good border between our alveoli and our blood vessels. So we want our alveoli to be nice, open grapes. We do not want them to look like little shriveled up raisins. So what surfactant does is that it's a lipid-based substance that basically sword fights with water, okay, to decrease water tension. So it enables the alveoli to be nice and open. During fetal development, alveoli, or I'm sorry, surfactant is typically not produced in the alveoli until about 37 weeks gestation. So you might hear things like, oh, the baby was born with their lungs not being fully matured. Well, that fully matured thing means that surfactant is not being produced. Sophia was actually born, um, she did not have surfactant. They had to give her an artificial surfactant. Um, she had some breathing issues. Next question, what are the pleura? So pleura are a serous membrane. And if you remember from chapter four, serous membranes are a two for one special, right? They're one membrane that's kind of folded over itself to make two different layers, okay? The inner layer is called the visceral layer. The outer layer is called the parietal layer. And we talked about this around the heart. But the lungs, they also have a pleurae. So if I were to draw a lung, here's another lung, okay? 
the blue would actually represent the visceral pleura. And then if I did the green like this, that would be the parietal pleura. And there is a little bit of pleural fluid in here, just a tiny bit. And what that does is that it connects these two pleurae together, um, like two pieces of saran wrap. And because of the pleura being adhered to each other, our lungs stay open, our lungs stay patent, like I just talked about with the alveoli. However, sometimes air can get in here, or blood, or a lot of mucus from an infection, and it can cause the pleura to disconnect. And then the lung can... So, sorry. I'm just trying to erase the... Uh blue here, then the lung can collapse. I want to show you what that looks like. I don't have to do it all. That's okay. So what can happen is that your lung, if the pleurae become detached, they can disconnect from each other. And it kind of looks like this. And that is called atelectasis. You may have seen in interventional radiology them treating a lung collapse. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to put a tube in here, a chest tube, and it's going to take out the air or the fluid or the blood and then get these two to reconnect with each other. Um, next question is, what are our respiratory gases? I think that one should probably be the easiest one on the page. Um, oxygen is a respiratory gas, and CO2 is a respiratory gas. We need to get this one from our environment, and we make this one in our body as a metabolic waste, and we need to get it out. Um, and believe it or not, this is actually the reason we breathe. Why? Because CO2 is a waste in the body. It's toxic, and if it builds up, we know that it can cause us to have our pH decline, if our pH becomes too acidic, our proteins to nature, and then we're just basically a hot mess. We can't function, okay? So O2 and CO2 are our respiratory gases, but CO2 is actually the reason that we breathe. Our oxygen levels actually have to get ridiculously critically low before oxygen becomes the primary motivator that, that stimulates our rate and depth of breathing. So the next question here is how are respiratory gases transported throughout the body? So we learned back in chapter 10, all right, so that's my red blood cell. Um, oxygen is carried um, bound to hemoglobin molecules that are found on red blood cells. Remember we did some Dr. Evil math here. So we talked about how for one red blood cell, okay, there are 250 million hemoglobin molecules. Okay, hopefully you remember that, okay? And then on every one hemoglobin molecule, we have four hemes, and that means that each of those hemes, or iron-containing groups, can bind to four oxygen molecules. So then we talked about how many oxygen molecules can one red blood cell carry. So if we did 250 million times four, that would be one billion O2 molecules per one little red blood cell. And then if we talk about how many red blood cells there are per cubic millimeter of blood. So in one little tiny speck or drop of blood, there are five million RBCs. And each one of those red blood cells is carrying about a billion molecules of oxygen. Mind exploding. And then we have CO2, okay? CO2 is not primarily carried by anything. Um, CO2 actually, so there's a red blood cell. And CO2, all right, cannot exist in the body in like little gas bubbles, okay? It has to be able to go in solution. And the red blood cell actually facilitates CO2, CO2. 
CO2, it actually will go through a reaction inside of the red blood cell that turns it into a bicarbonate ion, which is HCO3 minus. Um, it is a proton donor, meaning that it's going to be giving off an H+. Plus. So if there are more hydrogen ions, I'm sorry, if there's more carbon dioxide in the body, that means that there's going to be more H plus given off. If we have more H plus given off, that's concentration of hydrogen ions, what's going to happen to pH? Well, pH is going to decrease or become more acidic. And that can be bad. So again, the majority of our CO2 um, a little tiny bit of it is carried in the hemoglobin molecules. A little tiny bit of it can just be dissolved in plasma. The majority is done by this reaction. So CO2 goes through the red blood cell and gets converted into a form that can be carried throughout blood plasma in the form of a bicarbon ion. Um, what is hypoxia? So hypoxia, all right, is not enough oxygen. And in this chapter, I'm going to be sending you, you know, a more intense um, reading, like from that uh, medical school textbook. Hypoxia is without oxygen, and there's different ways or reasons why um, we would be without oxygen. Um, what pressure is breathing relative to in the environment? Well, that would be atmospheric pressure. So we breathe, and the pressure inside of our lungs is all relative to atmospheric pressure. When we take an inhalation, our lungs expand. Our lungs expand and the volume of our lungs increases. So volume increases. Um, and again, we're talking about volume versus pressure. So us inside of us versus atmospheric pressure. So inside of us, if the volume of our lungs increases when we inhale, then pressure is going to decrease because it's an inverse relationship. Because the pressure inside of our lungs decreases, air can flow in, and that decreases relative to atmospheric pressure. The opposite happens when we exhale. When we exhale, our volume in our chest decreases, pressure increases relative to atmospheric pressure, and air will come out. As we go up in elevation, what happens is that pressure decreases. So at atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760, okay? As we go up in elevation, that's going to decrease. Let's say it goes to 600. So that means that the difference between, let's say, atmospheric pressure is 760, pressure inside of us is, you know, 40, all right? So there's a mathematical difference between those two. As we go up to higher elevations, that pressure becomes... So the gradient, actually, the curve in which something's going to want to move from high to low is going to go down. So that's why it makes it more challenging to breathe. Also, you know, oxygen of the 760 here, say, makes up 20%. But if we go up to 600, okay, 20% of six, 600 is going to be different than 20% of 760. There's less available oxygen for us as we go up in elevation when pressure decreases. So that is what is going to affect breathing. That's what's also going to affect cooking. All right, and so for the last one, it says what is the path that air takes in the body. So we have our person. I'm going to make this a very beautiful drawing. Well, that looks like Beavis from Beavis and Butthead with huge shoulders and a tiny neck. That's a little better. All right. So air can come into the body really in one of two ways. It can come in via the nose, which is preferred, or the mouth, which is not preferred. 
And even though mouth breathing, we want to think, mm, who wants to hear mouth breathing? There's actually a physiological re reason why it's preferential to breathe through your nose and not your mouth, not just social. So air, I'm going to do it as white. Actually, I'm going to draw the rest of the structures first, and then I'll do that. So I told you that um, we've got the nasopharynx starting here, the oropharynx starting in the back of the throat. So the pharynx comes down here. We turn into the larynx, which is where the opening to your trachea is. Your trachea comes down here. And then it will separate into your primary bronchi. The primary bronchi then branch off into secondary and tertiary bronchi, and then they get down into these tiny little clusters, which are alveoli. So air gets inhaled, can come in through the nose or the mouth, but hopefully the nose, it comes down through the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngeopharynx, it will then, if we have a patent glottis with no epiglottis on top of it, goes down the trachea. Once it comes down to the trachea, it's going to hit this area right here, which is where the trachea bifurcates into the primary bronchi. That's called the carina. Um, air then passes down through the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi. Then we get into little itty baby bronchi that are called bronchioles. And then air will reach the alveoli. Everything up until this point, everything up until the alveoli has been conducting zone. Once we get into the alveoli, we're now in the respiratory zone. And this is where external respiration is going to happen. Oxygen from the environment is going to get into our body, and we are going to put that carbon dioxide that we produced inside of us out back into the environment. All right. I think I'm going to sum up there today. Um, I'm going to be doing your first section of notes shortly. Bye, everybody.